What if nobody comes? Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually going to be right back. Hello, everybody. We're just getting started, so we're going to give it a couple minutes for people. Probably not a couple minutes, but a couple seconds for people to um, go ahead and get get on in here. Hey, Jeff. I was like, his name is Scott. <laughs> All right, we still have a few people joining us. Okay, I think we should probably get started. Welcome everybody. My name is Michelle Bird. I'm the Public Affairs Director for Larimer County. I'm going to be kind of your Zoom host tonight, um, running, running the controls here behind the scenes um, and let kind of our panelists do what they do best, which is be subject matter experts about hazard mitigation. Um, just to give you a brief agenda of what we're going to do tonight, um, I'm going to go over some meeting logistics first about um, Zoom webinar and how you guys can interact with us, why it might look a little bit different than the meetings over Zoom you normally attend. Um, and then we're going to have our panelists, which you can see, um, see their bright and shining faces here with us. We're going to let them introduce themselves. Then actually what we're going to do is we're going to watch a video of the presentation. And the reason we did a video of the presentation um, is so that we could have a closed captioning option. So I'll remind you guys of this. You might need to crank your volume up to hear the video, but you should be able to hear it. And there is a closed caption option as well for those that may be um, hard of hearing or, or just closed captioning is a better option for them. After the video, what we're going to do, we're going to come back together as a group. Our panelists are going to um, come back with us and we're going to use the Q&A section to answer any of your guys' questions or hear input from you all. Um, and then we will close up the meeting at seven or earlier if we're done before that. So with that being said, just some brief meeting logistics. Um, if you've done web or Zoom meetings before, you might notice a Zoom meeting is looking a little bit different than this webinar. Um, you can only see the, vase, the faces of the panelists here. Um, one of the reasons we do that kind of in this public meetings um, setting is it's a little bit safer. I'm sure you all have heard of Zoom bombings where people break in and take over the screen um, and put inappropriate things on, on the screen and we don't want that to happen. So what we're doing tonight is doing a, a webinar to kind of prevent that. The other thing you'll notice is that there's no chat at the bottom. Um, again, this is a safety feature. There's been instances with the chat when you kind of let anybody come in and chat, they can put links out there um, to the whole group and the whole group can click on them and bad things happen. Um, so what we have instead is a Q&A. Um, so if you have questions for our panelists or you have input you want to give, you're going to use that Q&A function. It's down at the bottom of your screen um, and type in your questions. Um, once we get to the Q&A section, you, could, you can put in questions at any point, but once we get to that section of the evening, um, what I'll do is I'll read those questions out loud and make them live as we're answering the question. If for some reason we run out of time and we don't get to all the questions, the nice thing about this feature is that it kind of saves all those questions. It saves who um, asked the question and so our panelists can get back to you via email if we don't get time to get to your question or your input tonight. Um, also, so you guys know if you have to jump off early, we're going to have this whole thing available on Lamar County's YouTube channel. Um, it does take a little bit for Zoom to process the video, but once we get it processed, we'll get it up on Larimer County's YouTube channel. So all you need to do is go to YouTube and search for Larimer County and you should be able to find it there. So with that being said, I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves before we jump to the video. So Shale, why don't you go ahead first? Hi everyone and thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Shale Sabo. Um, I am with the Larimer County Office of Emergency Management. Um, I'm going to be the project lead for the hazard mitigation plan update, um, but in my day-to-day -day, um, job outside of things like COVID response, I do outreach education um, and grassroots resilience work as part of the County Office of Emergency Management. So that's me in a nutshell. All right, Scott, how about you jump on next? 
Hi everyone, I'm Scott Field. I'm a consultant with a company called Wood Environment and Infrastructure Solutions down in Denver. We do a lot of uh, uh, emergency management and hazard mitigation and disaster preparedness uh, consulting work. And we've been hired by the county to help them uh, with the update of the uh, hazard mitigation plan. And I'm gonna be the person whose voice you have to listen to for the next hour. So you're, you've been warned. Okay, our final panelist, it says his name is Scott Field, but it's not actually, so I'm going to go ahead and let him introduce himself. Yeah, my name is Jeff Brislon. I also work for a company called Wood, and uh, I'm the hazard mitigation lead in our hazard mitigation emergency management program, and I'm speaking to you two from my home office in Arvada, so I'm glad to be here. All right, so with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share my screen um, and we'll get the video started. The video is about an hour. Um, so if you guys have questions that come up during the presentation, go ahead and put them into that Q&A so you don't forget what they are. Um, and when the video is over, we will all come back together and answer your questions, hear your input, those good things. So here we go. Let me share my screen. And again, don't be afraid to um, crank up your volume to hear what's going on. Good evening and welcome to the first of two public meetings uh, for the 2020 update of the Larimer County Multi-Jurisdictional Hazard Mitigation Plan. And I'll explain what all that means here in a minute. But my name is Scott Field. I'm a consultant. Wood Environment and Infrastructure Solutions out of Denver. We've been hired by the county to help facilitate this uh, planning process. Uh, after I uh, just make some quick introductions here, I'm going to talk you through what is hazard mitigation planning and why you should care. Uh, and then I'm going to discuss, uh, and as well as how you can participate in that process. But then I'm going to talk about what are the different hazards that Larimer County faces and try and, you know, try and discuss what the risk from these different hazards looks like. Then I'm going to discuss what is the county's strategy for hazard mitigation. By that I mean basically what is Larimer County doing to protect the county from uh, natural and human caused hazards. And then lastly I'm going to talk about what the project schedule is, where we go from here, and how you can stay involved. Uh, I'm going to talk here for about an hour and then uh, the second half of this meeting we're going to open up for you or public discussion where we'd like to get your questions and comments and feedback and find out what your thoughts and your experiences are. Let me introduce myself. My name is Scott Field. Uh, I'm joined tonight by Shale Sabo with the Larimer County Office of Emergency Management and Michelle Bird from the Larimer County Public Affairs Office, as well as uh, my colleague Amy Carr from the uh, Wood Consulting Team. Note uh, up front that uh, while we're going to referring to pandemic mitigation in the, con in the broader context of this plan. This is not a plan specifically related to the current coronavirus pandemic. And that's not really uh, the main focus of tonight's conversation. All right, so what is hazard mitigation planning and why should you care about it? When I talk about hazards, what I mean by that is anything that can potentially cause damage or severe disruption to the that can be a natural disaster like a flood or a wildfire or a tornado, or it could be something resulting from human action, such as a hazardous materials release or a power outage or something. When I talk about vulnerability, by that I mean, where, how is the community vulnerable to or how can the community be affected by that hazard? So if you look at this um, diagram here, on the left-hand side kind of shows the characteristics of the different hazards. And then on the right-hand side shows what are the community assets that are potentially threatened by that hazard. And then where those two circles overlap, that's where we have the potential for loss or damage. Basically, if we have a hazard, but it doesn't really impact anything, we're not as worried about that. It's where those two circles overlap, where that potential for loss or damage exists, that's where the risk is to risk, that's what I mean, is think of this overlapping red circle here. When I talk about mitigation in this context, I'm talking about specific actions that are taken before a disaster 
to reduce losses or lower that risk. Basically, we're trying to shrink that red overlapping area as much as we can here. So why is that important? Well, there's a uh, common perception that disasters are increasing both in terms of frequency and in terms of, of size and cost. And that's not just a perception. It's actually backed up by the data. Uh, this chart comes from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And the stacked columns show that number of billion dollar disasters that have occurred in this country each year since 1980. Uh, this is the number of disasters that caused a billion dollars or more in damage and this is these are uh, inflation adjusted so it's not just uh, inflation is not uh, the reason why things are going up here. So you can see 20, 30 years ago uh, they were relatively rare. We only have a few a year. Now uh, they're much more common in the last uh, 10, 20 years, they've really increased. The black line also shows the cumulative cost of those disasters in millions of dollars, which has also gone up uh, tremendously. So it's not just a perception, it's definitely a trend of more disasters and more bigger, more expensive disasters. And there's several, several things driving that. One is simply more people, increased population growth, but more importantly, more people who are living or choosing to live in areas that are at more risk, uh, more people building homes in the mountains in areas where they're at risk of wildfire or in areas that are potentially at risk of flooding or landslide or other natural hazards. And I say um, people in homes, but along with that also comes the uh, commercial buildings and infrastructure like roads, power lines and sewer lines that comes along to support uh, in addition to the population growth and community growth, we're also just the building costs have gone up so more when those infrastructure, when those uh, pieces of infrastructure and buildings are damaged, it costs so much more to rebuild them than it did the first time around. So those are definitely factors, but part of it is has a number of other uh, initiatives relating to uh, climate resilience. Uh, but we are definitely in, in each of these hazards, one of the things we're looking at is how our changing weather patterns uh, have the potential to make these uh, make storms more severe and make these hazards more damaging. And then lastly, we kind of have this uh, snowball effect we see more and more where one disaster will kind of then cause or magnify the impacts of other disasters. And kind of the, the, the classic example there is, you know, we have a drought in Colorado, things get dry, that causes more uh, frequent wildfires and more severe wildfires. And then after that, after the fire's gone, you have a burn scar, which then increases your flood risk. So uh, one, more and more we're seeing these disasters kind of uh, feeding into one. There's several reasons why Larimer County is making it a priority to address these hazards. Uh, first of all, there's an obvious legal and moral responsibility to protect the, the people and the property in the county. And also, as we just saw, the costs of the responding to and recovering from these disasters continues to go up. And the cost of doing nothing is too much. It's just, it's too expensive to not address these trends. Many of these disasters are predictable uh, to at least some degree. I can't tell you when your next flood's going to happen in Larimer County or exactly where, but I'm pretty sure you're going to have one. And we have a pretty, we have, can kind of identify the general areas that are most likely to be impacted. So if we can predict them, we should probably do something about that. And there are activities that can, that you can do to reduce losses from these. Usually, you know, you can't always, you can't prevent tornadoes or floods or large scale disasters like that. Um, but there are things you can do to reduce the losses and lessen the impact of those disasters. They've been proven to work uh, here in Colorado, nationally and around the world. Uh, they're very cost effective. They're beneficial for the environment as well as uh, kind of the built environment. And there are, there are uh, funds available to help with them. So the goal here is to kind of, we want to break this kind of vicious cycle here, what sometimes be like, you know, we have a disaster like a flood and then we rebuild those homes. And then a few years later they flood again and we have to rebuild them again. I mean, we've kind of seen this pattern nationally. The purpose of mitigation is to break this cycle. 
so that after you have a disaster, you rebuild stronger or, and better and smarter so that the next time we have a disaster, we don't, we don't have the same problem happen over and over. I said before these uh, projects are cost effective. It was a study done a few years ago that looked at mitigation projects that had been done across the country. And what they found is that for every dollar spent on those projects, saved six dollars down the road in response and recovery costs from that disaster. So if you spend uh, one dollar to, to mitigate against the hazard, you're going to save six dollars when that disaster actually happens down the road. And you can see that ratio changes a little bit for the different types of hazard, but overall these are very cost-effective measures. If I told you you could spend a dollar today to save six dollars tomorrow, probably take me up on that. So it's a very, very fiscally responsible for governments too. Uh, as I said, there is uh, funding available to help with this. To, in addition to the county's general funds, there's a number of federal grant streams, uh, primarily ones through the Federal Emergency Management Agency, uh, or FEMA. And I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on kind of the legal intricacies of the Disaster Management Act of 2000. Basically, uh, the bottom line is in order to be eligible for all these federal mitigation funds, you have to have in place an, a FEMA approved hazard mitigation plan. The idea of this plan is, is it's the document that helps guide your mitigation activities, ties everything to, together in one coordinated manner. It integrates mitigation into other planning mechanisms like the county's comprehensive plan or capital improvement plans. It helps to guide future development so that we're planning and building in a way that's smart so that we're reducing our vulnerability rather than increasing it. And the overall goal of the document is to reduce losses and make the community more resilient to disasters. So the good news is Larimer County already has a mitigation plan, the cover's shown here. It's actually had one in place for, for many, many years. It was last updated in 2016. Uh, but the law requires that it be updated every five years to make sure that you're uh, taking into account chain, uh, changes and make sure everything's updated as well as uh, in, in, uh, update and improve on what the county has done to uh, reduce disaster uh, losses. So that's why we're here today is we're uh, beginning the five-year update of the county's mitigation plan. Stage process we follow to go through that. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. But the first step is just kind of getting organized and getting together and figuring out uh, what the plan is going to cover and address and who's part of the planning team. We're going to conduct that risk assessment where we look at identifying those hazards and those vulnerabilities and, and again, where those two circles overlap. Uh, then we're going to develop, or in this case, update since the county already has one, we're going to update the county's mitigation strategy, which is the, and here's what we're going to do about those. Here's how we're going to reduce those, those uh, damages and losses. And then lastly, uh, phase four is the formal adoption of the plan and the process for how we keep it going over the next five years, because we don't want this to be a document that uh, sits on the shelf in a nice pretty three ring binder for five years. The goal is for this to be a living document that actually continu continues to work to make uh, more safe and resilient community. So I mentioned uh, one of the first steps is to determine what the planning area is or what's covered by the plan. And that, that may seem like a silly question. It's a Larimer County plan, so it covers Larimer County, right? Well, yes, but uh, of course there's a number of other jurisdictions contained within Larimer. Uh, both the uh, incorporated cities and towns, as well as a number of special districts like fire districts and sanitation districts. And many of those jurisdictions have also chosen to participate in this plan to help uh, reduce disaster impacts within their borders and make sure that they're also eligible for FEMA funds. So that's why when I called this a multi-jurisdictional plan earlier, that's why, because while this is a Larimer County plan, it also includes um, a number of other jurisdictions. And this is kind of the list. So it includes all the incorporated cities and towns, uh, fire protection districts, and a number of other special districts. Uh, there won't be a test on this at the end of the presentation, don't worry. But when you actually get to the draft plan, if you look on here and see your specific community on here, there'll be a, a, an appendix you can look at if you live in Estes Park, uh, for example, and you just, there'll be a specific annex that deals with uh, 
is how the risk for Estes Park is different than the risk in Earth or for Collins. So when I, again, when I refer to a multi-jurisdictional plan, this is what I'm talking about. And, uh, for the rest of this presentation, as I, whenever I talk about the county or participating jurisdictions, I'm not just talking about uh, the county of Larimer County, I'm also talking about these participating cities and towns and special districts. Uh, the different uh, group or people that we have around the table as part of the planning team includes uh, government representatives, both from the county and, and the different cities and towns and districts. Uh, some of the agencies listed here that have responsibility for hazard mitigation or uh, public protection or uh, regulate planning and development and so forth, as well as uh, businesses, nonprofit representation, uh, schools, different coalitions and special districts. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see some of the state and federal stakeholders that are part of, of the process or that we're consulting with. Uh, a lot of the data that I'm going to be referring to comes from either the Colorado Geological Society or the National Weather Service and so forth. Of course, our, our uh, key partners to this are the Colorado Office of Emergency Management, which is part of the uh, Department of Public Safety, uh, and then uh, the FEMA Regional Office. Uh, out. A big part of this process and this update is making sure that uh, we involve the community and the public in this update. We don't want this to just to be a bunch of government folks sitting in a plan, uh, developing, our, uh, you know, developing in a vacuum. Uh, the first step here is this public meeting that you're attending. And again, thank you for participating. Uh, we also have a public survey that we've made available online. And I'll show this link again at the end of the presentation, but we'd love to have everybody here uh, take this link and, or take this survey and pass it on to whoever you think might be interested. Uh, to give us your input on your perceptions and your experiences with hazards and what you think the county should be doing about them. Uh, once we get a draft of the plan written, we will have a, a draft of, of that plan available for public review and comment, probably uh, end of the summer or, or early fall. And then uh, concurrent with that, we'll have a second public review where we kind of talk through the plan in more detail and introduce it to you and see what you think about it. Again, get your comments and input. Uh, if you want to stay uh, updated uh, going forward, uh, this link here uh, is to the county's webpage for this uh, mitigation plan update process, and that will have uh, updates on the process as we go, and we'll have those uh, uh, future meeting dates as uh, once that as we have. Them. What we've done so far, so we uh, kicked off this process in April, just over a, a month ago, and we had our, our second planning planning meeting a couple weeks ago, where we focused on updating the hazard and risk assessment part of the plan. Uh, we've been doing a lot of data collection, both uh, from the, the county uh, GIS information from the county assessor's office, as well as uh, federal and online databases of uh, disaster and loss information. And we're currently, uh, the consultant team is uh, working on, right, on updating the risk assessment and the capability assessment parts of that plan uh, based on that data research and input. All right, so now I'm going to talk, get into talking about the hazards that Larimer County faces and what the risk from those hazards kind of looks like. And when I talk about hazards, I'm meaning both natural and human caused hazards, things that can cause damage to the community. This is the what can happen part of the conversation. And it's more than just uh, creating a list. We want to analyze and define and help describe those hazards. So we're going to look at what has happened here before. Uh, what have been past occurrences of this hazard? What types of floods and fires and tornadoes has Larimer County seen in the past? Are we gonna look at where can it happen? Is it something that uh, the entire county is susceptible to like a winter storm or are there specific areas like floodplains that are at greater risk? Uh, how severe might it be? How bad is bad? Uh, what, what kind of magnitude or scale are we looking at to measure the damage from this, uh, this hazard? We can talk about how it might be different from the future. Uh, and I, as I said, I'm not really going to get into climate change a great deal in this presentation, but we know that the future is probably not going to look like the past in many ways. So how might that be different? And then trying to look at uh, how likely is it to happen or how frequent, how often is this hazard likely to happen in Larimer County? Second half of that, then uh, on the right-hand side of the 
green circle is are the, how are we vulnerable to this hazard, which is the what's going to be affected or what's going to happen when this hazard uh, occurs. Uh, if, if it's an, an area of um, a specific geographic area, like a floodplain or something, we, the, the hazard can affect. We want to know how many people live in that uh, or work in those hazard areas. We're going to want to identify uh, both homes and commercial or business structures that are in that area, as well as critical facilities and infrastructure, uh, and things like roads or power lines, schools and hospitals, things like that that have a uh, that have a broader impact beyond just themselves if they were to be damaged. We're going to look at kind of uh, trying to determine and add up the dollar value of those structures to get a sense of how much property is at risk in there. But we're also going to look at his, at properties or areas with historical or cultural significance or natural resource areas that it's hard to put a dollar value on. So it's not just about dollars in a sense here. Uh, on top of that, we're going to try and identify development trends. Uh, that may be increasing or decreasing vulnerability to each hazard. And then uh, as part of the total of that, we're going to try and estimate what are the potential losses from that hazard to try and help the county prioritize where to focus uh, their efforts and their mitigation spending. Uh, also associated with this kind of the, uh, the third half uh, of the risk assessment, if you will, is to analyze what the county and the jurisdictions already have in place and what they're already doing to mitigate hazards. And this can be something like looking at existing uh, policies uh, and, and ordinances like regulations on who and how you can build in, in a floodplain or programs that encourage homeowners to develop defensible space around their homes and so forth. We're also going to look at what is the uh, each jurisdiction's ability to implement mitigation initiatives. Do they have the technical capability to do these projects, and do they have the fiscal ability to kind of manage and administer them if they do happen, uh, or when they uh, when they get approved? Uh, and then a part of that, in addition to identifying what the county is doing or the county and the jurisdictions are doing, we also look where there might be gaps or opportunities uh, for improvement. So, in terms of past disasters. Uh, this map uh, comes from FEMA and just shows uh, the number of federally declared disasters uh, in each county in Colorado. And that black square at the top, uh, unfortunately, is uh, Larimer County leading the pack. Uh, you've been included in 26 federal disaster declarations since 1953, which is the most of any Colorado county. Uh, looking on the left hand side, you can see them broken down. Not quite half of them are from wildfire. Uh, seven more from flood. Most of the rest are from severe weather of one kind or another. Uh, you notice the, the two the biological disaster declarations. Those are both uh, 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 related to the current uh, coronavirus pandemic. And if you're wondering how Larimer County got a coastal storm disaster declaration, <laughs> that's actually from uh, Hurricane Katrina. And Colorado was included in that disaster because of all the refugees that we took in uh, and helped as part of that disaster. So this is the list of hazards that uh, the planning team has identified for inclusion in the 2020 updated plan. The only thing that's new on this list is down at the bottom is dam failure incident. All the rest of these were already addressed in the 2016 plan and we're just kind of updating that information. But uh, the county felt that uh, we had some additional data on, uh, on dams in around Larimer County and the planning team felt uh, that needed to be added to this, year, to this plan. So to go through and talk about uh, each of these in a little bit, uh, I have a few slides on each of these hazards to talk about them in detail. So one of the biggest uh, hazards in the county of course is, is flooding and we're concerned uh, not just with uh, both with flash flooding, which is uh, more common in the, in the urban areas as well as riverine areas. Uh, this map shows the, the dark blue areas are the areas that are the identified floodplains that have a 1% chance of flooding every year sometimes called the 100-year floodplain. The lighter blue areas have a 0.2% uh, chance of flooding each year, or sometimes called the 500-year floodplain. Of course, uh, flooding is not limited to those areas, particularly in urban areas. You can have flash flooding really anywhere, but those are the areas that are most at risk and where we're kind of focusing a lot of the flood mitigation efforts. 
Uh, the data on this slide comes from, again, from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, and it records 54 flood events in Larimer County since 1954. That includes both riverine floods and flash flooding. Uh, you can kind of see the breakdown here. It lists all the different, uh, the different jurisdictions that have been impacted by those different floods. Uh, and, and there have probably been some smaller ones. This isn't, uh, the, this database certainly doesn't capture everything, but it probably captures the, the, the biggest ones. Uh, between them all, it looks at, you can see a little over $300 million in property damage resulting from these 54 floods. Uh, it, the, the second to last column shows a couple hundred thousand dollars in crop damage. If that number looks suspiciously small to you, you're right, uh, because this database only records uninsured crop damage. So on another table we have, we're, we're looking at actually insured uh, crop losses or crop damage from floods, which is much more significant. Uh, all told, uh, this database shows seven deaths and 40 injuries as a result of these floods. And most of them, most of those were in Fort Collins, uh, which has done a lot in the last few decades, as, you, as you're probably aware, to uh, reduce the vulnerability. Uh, we'll be asking everybody for your, your uh, questions or impacts or, or, uh, or uh, questions or comments on, on all these hazards at the end. I'm just kind of going to go through them all right now. Uh, the next major hazard we want to look at is wildfires, which uh, nobody here is surprised to learn that wildfire is a major hazard in Larimer County. Uh, of course, wildfire really is an annual event uh, in not just in Larimer, but throughout Colorado now. This list just shows uh, that previous slide where I showed those 11 wildfire federal declarations. Uh, this is those 11 wildfires over the last 20 years. There have been additional fires since 2012, of course, uh, but none that uh, were large or damaging enough to result in a, in a fire declaration. But that just kind of gives you a sense. It's not quite an annual event that you have a large destructive wildfire, but, but pretty close to it. These happen pretty frequently. Uh, obviously, the, the uh, more or less the entire county, anywhere there's trees is at risk of wildfire. But for purposes of, uh, of for hazard mitigation purposes, we're most worried about uh, what we can do to protect the areas uh, where something's going to be damaged. Again, where there's that vulnerability and that overlap. And what that usually means in the context of wildfire is where we have the built environment intermixing with uh, areas that are at risk of wildfire. The, the uh, firefighters call that the wildland urban interface or WUI. And this map shows uh, the different areas, different areas of wildland urban interface from lowest to highest risk. You can see the dark red areas are the areas at highest risk based on both the, uh, the increased housing density and how intense the wildfires likely be in that area. Uh, overall, there's an, that, uh, almost 20,000 acres within the county that are at high or highest risk of, wild, of wildfire. And those are the areas where we want to concentrate uh, the bulk of the county's uh, mitigation efforts for wildfire. Spring summer storms or thunderstorms, of course, a very uh, common occurrence throughout the, throughout the county. Uh, they don't always, you know, the majority of them don't cause uh, a lot of damage, but when they do, they can be really significant and widespread. Uh, we talk about summer storms or spring storms. We're really kind of talking about three different things. Uh, one is hail, uh, second is lightning, and the third is kind of severe winds or straight line. So we'll also talk about tornadoes here in a second. Uh, in terms of hail is very common. Uh, the database shows four and a half million dollars in damage in the county since 1954, but uh, as we mentioned before, that is only counting uninsured damages. Uh, the actual insured losses are, are uh, quite a bit more than that. The uh, most damaging single event, uh, or single hailstorm, uh, was in 1995 in Wellington, and that one storm alone did uh, $500,000 in damage. Uh, lightning is another uh, statewide hazard. Uh, and the database lists 10 deaths and 76 injuries from lightning just since 1996. Uh, that's only going back about 25 years. So that's pretty significant. Don't generally tend to see a lot of property damage from lightning, although it can happen. Uh, but more frequently from that, what we do see is it causes power outages. And of course, uh, lightning strikes are the uh, uh, very common 
lead to wildfire starts. So that's uh, again, when we talk about those cascading hazards. Uh, severe wind, also not uh, very common in Colorado and in Larimer County. Uh, overall, since 1954, that, that database lists uh, almost $14 million in damage from severe wind. Uh, the single most damaging event was a windstorm in April of 1999, and that one windstorm did over $7 million in damage. So it can be really significant. Related to thunderstorms or tornadoes, in fact, they're usually generated by thunderstorms, but we kind of break them out to talk about them separately here just because they're, they're a little different and they can be so devastating. Uh, of course, the eastern part of the county is most vulnerable, or they're mo more common up there, but uh, tornadoes can and do happen even in the mountains. Uh, we, uh, the uh, NOAA database lists 31 events uh, or tornadoes within uh, Larimer County since 1954 and uh, records $65,000 worth of damages or recorded damages. There may have been more than that. Uh, from those 31 tornadoes. And notice that uh, that's just within Larimer County. So for example, that doesn't include all the damage in Windsor from the, the 2008 tornado there. Uh, the, the lines on this map show the, uh, the, the different paths that the different tornadoes have, uh, have taken. Uh, and then those yellow dots show mobile home parks, which is something that we take into account when we're looking at tornado risk because of course uh, tornado uh, mobile homes tend to be very vulnerable to uh, tornadoes and the people in living in mobile homes don't, don't usually have basements to go hide in so it's a particularly risky uh, area of course severe weather isn't limited to spring and summer uh, in the winter we have uh, severe winter storms which can include not only heavy snow and blizzards with blowing snow can also include uh, ice storms or, or ice uh, formation and extreme cold temperatures. Uh, the NOAA database records 379 uh, recorded uh, extreme or severe winter events, winter weather events in Larimer County. Uh, most of those are, I mean, we're kind of used to severe uh, winter weather here in Colorado, but occasionally they do get severe enough that they cause significant damage. Uh, you see $31 million in property damage from those different storms and one fatality in the county is listed uh, as, um, as a, a direct result from severe winter storms. Uh, particularly when we're looking at uh, vulnerability and mitigating against winter weather, we particularly tend to focus on populations that are most at risk from storms. And that can be uh, the elderly, people disabilities and really critically people who depend on electrical equipment either for their mobility and independence or for uh, for, for to stay alive like oxygen uh, machines and so forth uh, those populations tend to be much more severely impacted by severe winter weather okay shifting gears uh, from the more atmospheric hazards we're going to talk about more geologic or ground-based hazards and the first of those is earthquake a lot of Coloradans don't think that we have earthquakes in Colorado, but um, as this map shows, we definitely do. Uh, this map comes from the uh, Colorado Geologic Survey, and each red dot uh, shows an, uh, a, historic, a recorded earthquake. And the size of the dot, the bigger the dot, the more severe. And if you look up in Larimer County, you can see uh, two, one particularly big dot that I'll talk about here in a second. The purple squiggly lines represent the mapped or identified faults within the state. Now, because we're not California, for example, we don't have we don't have big earthquakes really often, which is great. But the downside of that is there hasn't been as much effort focused on identifying and mapping faults in Colorado as there has in places like Colorado. So these are the faults that we know of. There are almost certainly more than that. Uh, but there, as you can see, uh, there is a significant earthquake risk in uh, in Colorado and in Larimer County. Not something that happens uh, with a great deal of frequency, but when they do happen, they can be pretty devastating. Uh, that big dot in Larimer County that I referenced was actually from November 1980 or 1882, uh, and that quake was believed to be the largest in Colorado's history, or at least in modern recorded history. Uh, took place so it was believed to be centered near uh, Estes Park and was a magnitude six or very uh, magnitude 6.6, .6, a very uh, significant earthquake. More recently, in 1967, there was a series of quakes throughout the Denver metro area that were mostly in the uh, uh, 
magnitude four to five range caused um, over a million dollars of damage in, in the Denver area. And of course, if those happened now, they would cause a lot more than a million dollars, one million dollars of damages. And then even more recently in 2011, we had a magnitude 5.3 earthquake down in Trinidad that you may have heard of. So again, not something that happens every day, fortunately, but when they do happen, they can be uh, really damaging and really severe. Another geologic hazard is landslide. Uh, and this map kind of shows that the red area shows areas that have where um, landslide debris has been identified or deposits, areas that we know landslides have happened in the past and therefore could happen again. And then the yellow area shows areas that have been identified as being at, uh, at particular risk from landslide. And everything out of that area doesn't mean that there's no risk there. These are necessarily so these are just areas that have been uh, specifically identified by the geologic survey folks uh, as areas that are most at risk. As you can see, the biggest risk is uh, along uh, Highway 14, as well as kind of along that, the western edge of the metro area. Kind of a subset of landslide is rock slide or rock fall, whereas landslide is referring more to like soil and mud and debris flow. Rock slide is just rocks falling. Uh, again, you can see uh, kind of the, a large risk along Highway 14, uh, as well as several areas around Estes Park and kind of more mountainous areas. Uh, and, and these, uh, if you're suspicious of the rather square and, and linear nature of some of these areas, uh, that's, uh, that's because those are the areas that have been studied and analyzed and mapped for rock slide hazard. Uh, I'm not saying that there isn't a rock fall potential outside of uh, mapped areas, just that those are the areas that have been studied the most and where it's been uh, identified. Uh, related to uh, landslide and rockfall, but kind of considered a separate hazard is uh, soil erosion or deposition. By erosion, I mean is what happens when soil gets washed away uh, or blown away, either by wind or rain or uh, flooding. And then deposition is kind of the other end of that equation is where that soil then gets dumped it winds up at the end. And obviously there's, there's problems associated with both ends of that equation. Uh, also related to soil and deposition, we also include in there uh, things like expansive soils uh, and collapsible soils where uh, soils may shift and move, which can damage uh, property and structures and things like uh, water and sewer lines. Uh, subsidence where uh, ground may give way and create sinkholes, uh, which is particularly common in areas that have been undermined. Uh, mining activity in the past. This map again comes from the Colorado Geologic Survey and it shows uh, different kind of a, a, a composite map of the different geologic hazards other than earthquake uh, within the county. And again, the gray areas does, are, are, are not uh, areas where there is no risk. There's areas where we don't necessarily have good data for. But you can see here the uh, red areas, there's a number of, of areas that are at uh, pretty severe risk from the uh, geologic hazards. Okay, moving away from geologic hazards, we're going to talk now about biological hazards, uh, which does include uh, pandemics and epidemics and other public health outbreaks. And I included this quote from the, the 2016, the current Larimer County Hazard Mitigation Plan. So uh, it's definitely, this is definitely something the county was uh, is aware of or was aware of in 2016 and was uh, preparing for. The right hand side is just a screen cap that I took from the county's website uh, the other day showing uh, reported uh, cases of uh, coronavirus infections uh, throughout the county. So it's definitely something that uh, people uh, that the county was aware of and planning for. Uh, looking historically, we've had basically five uh, significant pandemics over the last hundred years or so. A lot of people have I heard a lot in the news of people talking about the 1918-19 uh, Spanish flu, but there were also uh, significant pandemics in the 50s and 60s. It didn't kill as many people, but were pretty lethal, as well as, of course, the uh, H1N1 outbreak in 2009 and the uh, ongoing uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, which was over 90,000 deaths as of last week. And by the time uh, you're seeing this, it's uh, expected to be well over 100,000. When we look at, uh, at uh, mitigating against public health emergencies and biological hazards, uh, a lot of the focus is on 
uh, vulnerable populations and people who are more at risk potentially from hazards. That can include young children, although fortunately not in uh, with not in this pandemic, but definitely the elderly, uh, as well as people living in poverty, and critically people without good health care or health insurance or access to uh, health care. There's a lot more that could be said here about uh, the response and kind of the reaction to the current pandemic. But remember, this plan is really focused on mitigating against and reducing the impacts of really the next pandemic. Okay, moving on, as I said before, we're talking, looking at not just natural hazards, but also uh, hazards resulting from human activity. And the first one of those we want to look at is hazardous materials releases. Uh, so this data comes from the National Response Center, which tracks all uh, reported hazardous materials releases in the country. Uh, and it shows uh, 289 incidents going back to 1987. And you can see there's definitely been an, an increase, a general increase over the last 40 years or so. Uh, for the last, since 2000, basically for the last 20 years, uh, the county has uh, experienced an average of 12 hazardous material spills per year. Now, the vast majority of those uh, are fairly minor with some localized cleanup costs, uh, but don't really result in any damage or injury. The National Response Center database does uh, list 10 fatalities and 30 or 29 injuries associated with those hazardous materials incidents. But I do want to point out just a big caveat with those. The way the National Response Center uh, calculates that is if there's, say, a tanker truck that overturns on I-25 and spills a bunch of diesel on the highway and the driver is killed in the accident, that is counted as a fatality in a hazardous materials incident here, even though the driver died from the accident, not from the actual hazardous materials. So, so take those numbers with a grain of salt. But it is, to, but it is important to keep in mind that these type of incidents can cause uh, fatalities, injuries, property damage, and evacuation of homes. Uh, on the right hand side, kind of breaks down those 289 incidents. Uh, you can. You look, you'll see they're more or less evenly broken down between fixed facilities and storage tanks and so forth versus transportation uh, loads like, uh, like uh, trucks and pipelines and uh, railroads. Um, there are, in terms of fixed facilities, there's uh, the, the county uh, maintains uh, data on different facilities that store and use and transport uh, hazardous chemicals and so forth. The most serious ones Meet, uh, that are required by the Environmental Protection Agency to maintain what are called risk management plans, which are very detailed plans for how they're going to prevent releases and what they would do if one happens. There are 10 of those within Larimer County, so it's something we uh, look at as part of our, our uh, planning for, for this. And then at the bottom here, I've listed, uh, if, you look, if you go through the data, um, only about 3.5% of, the, of these 289 hazardous materials incidents were caused by some sort of natural uh, phenomenon, whether it was either a flood or something else. So that means the other 96.5% were caused by human activity, like an accident or a, a equipment failure or something. Next human caused hazard I want to talk about is a utility disruption, which can include uh, loss of electrical power or gas, uh, even pro uh, uh, propane service, uh, water or sewer service, or communications infrastructure. You know, it wasn't that long ago that uh, loss of broadband internet was considered an annoyance at most. Uh, now, uh, it's very different. You know, that can have severe economic impacts. Um, utility disruptions are fairly common uh, in Larimer County, but the, most of them only uh, affect a small number of people for a fairly short time. And, and unfortunately, we don't have I don't have really uh, good data on, on that because the uh, utility companies don't really like to advertise the, the number of outages. Uh, but most of them, I said, are fairly minor and are more of an, more annoyances. I'm sure you've all experienced them at one time or another. Uh, larger, more long-lasting and widespread outages are less common, but they can happen. Generally, they, what we see uh, from a, a hazard standpoint is if they occur during good weather, they're not as big a deal. It's when they happen during periods of extreme heat or extreme cold that you start to see really severe impacts from them. Uh, particularly, we, again, we're looking at vulnerable populations, uh, elderly who may be more susceptible to extreme heat. Uh, if the air conditioning goes out, 
uh, and again, people who are dependent on electrical equipment for mobility or for uh, life functions. Uh, so identifying those uh, vulnerable populations and what we can do to help them is a real priority. And then we also look at the uh, impacts on commercial uh, businesses and critical infrastructure, because even relatively short outages to critical infrastructure can have severe impacts. So we want to look at how we can maintain uh, backup power options for some uh, types of facilities. Next, uh, we want to talk about civil disturbances. And to be clear, uh, we're not talking about peaceful protesting here. We're not talking about anyone uh, exercising their First Amendment rights. We're specifically talking about riots and acts that involve violence, property damage, or disorder that are severe enough to uh, require law enforcement or even National Guard involvement. It doesn't seem like something that it happens a lot, but there have been, uh, we found reports of 10 riots in Larimer County uh, going back to the 80s. The majority of those uh, were either focused at the university or uh, came from sports team victories like the uh, Super Bowl uh, win in uh, 1999. I can't believe I can't remember when the last time the Broncos won the Super Bowl. I'm a bad fan. Uh, and also the uh, when the Avs won the Stanley Cup, we saw uh, riots and significant property damage from both of those events. Uh, so property damage and, and personal injuries uh, are definitely possible and can happen in these types of disturbances. They can cause economic disruptions, although those tend to be usually fairly short term. Uh, they can also have an impact on the government's ability to operate and provide government services. Uh, but and again, those are usually fairly short term. But the other more long term effect is its impacts on the public's confidence in uh, government's ability to do its job. Okay, and the last hazard I want to talk about, uh, which I uh, mentioned uh, initially, is dam failure or incident. And this is a, a new hazard we're adding to the plan this year based on some additional data that we've gotten from the uh, uh, State Dam Safety Bureau. And I say dam failure or incident because straight up dam failures are very, very rare. Uh, they don't happen very often. But what does happen more often is you may have an incident where uh, a dam may be overtopping or there may be something else where it's putting out a lot of water out or uh, it can still have impacts even if the dam itself structurally is just fine. So that's why we've included both of those. This map shows each of these triangles shows uh, all the, the known classified dams within the county based on their hazard class. And those red triangles are the high hazard dams. I, I don't wanna stress here, the way this classification works is uh, is not, those are uh, not saying that those red dams are at a high risk of failure. Uh, the way the Corps of Engineers classifies dams is if there is someone that is at risk that could potentially be impacted by that dam, if something did happen, then it's considered a high hazard dam. Uh, if there aren't people potentially at risk, but there may be property, then that's a significant hazard dam. And if neither of those, then it's considered hazard. So again, those classifications are not based on the likelihood that there's going to be a problem, but what would be or what could be the impacts if there were a problem. Uh, nevertheless, you can see we have a lot of high hazard dams, and significant hazard dams in the county, uh, and also included our analysis, but not shown on this map, is there's a number of counties that are kind of upstream of the county that could potentially impact the county if they did go. So uh, we've gotten some additional data, as I said, from the state on dam inundation areas and so forth. So we're going to be including this in the uh, updated plan this year. Okay, so to summarize, uh, this chart here shows all the different hazards that I just talked about. And then what we've tentatively, what we think the different uh, risk or the, the impacts of these potentially hazards can be in terms of how frequent or how often do we think they're likely to happen? Uh, what is the spatial extent? How big an area are they likely to impact? How severe are they likely to be? What are the impacts going to be? And then kind of what's the overall significance? And you can rank from high to moderate to low. Uh, the dam failure is listed at the bottom uh, with a bunch of to be determines because we're still uh, conducting that analysis. So we haven't crunched those numbers yet. I'm, I'm pretty sure it won't quite be at the bottom of the list uh, at the end of the day. So. Um, again, when we get to the discussion comment or part, and uh, also when you take the public survey, we're going to ask you what you think the different uh, significance of each of these hazards ought to be. 
All right, so moving on, now we're going to talk about and what are we going to do about this? So this is where we get into what is the county's strategy for mitigating these hazards? So there's three different levels uh, that we talk about that we're going to talk about when we get into the strategy. Uh, first is kind of the is uh, what are the is establishing goals, which are kind of the broad guidelines or policy statements of what does the county want to accomplish to reduce hazards and, uh, and lessen losses from disasters. And those are kind of like big picture goals. And then uh, counties also developed a set of objectives, which are kind of a step below goals that are a little more focused on implementation, they're less policy and vision and more, what do we actually want to do here? Uh, and then below that is a long list of actions, which are the specific projects and activities that the county wants to do to achieve those goals and objectives and to specifically reduce losses. So to give you kind of an example, a goal might be uh, that we want to reduce damage from flooding or protect property from flooding. Uh, an objective might be a little more focused down of we want to reduce uh, stormwater impacts or improve uh, the city's stormwater management system. And then a specific action or project would be what need to uh, install a bigger culvert at the intersection of X and Y. So that's kind of how that hierarchy works here. Again, the county has an existing hazard mitigation plan and has already identified a lot of these things. These are the goals that were listed in the uh, county's 2016 mitigation plan uh, to protect people, property, and natural resources, uh, improve the county's ability to reduce losses from disasters, uh, strengthen communication and coordination, not just between public agencies, but also with non-governmental organizations, businesses, and the public. Uh, we want to increase public awareness of hazards and mitigation options and what you can do about those hazards. And then integrate hazard mitigation more into other planning mechanisms, which I kind of alluded to earlier, which is making sure that mitigation is not just in this one mitigation plan, but something that's integrated in comprehensive planning, capital improvement plan plans and the like. Uh, the mitigation or the planning team is in the process of reviewing these goals uh, and so far hasn't seen any, uh, I think these goals are still pretty solid and we don't anticipate any big changes to these goals for the 2020 plan update. But uh, again, we want to hear your thoughts. So when you get to the uh, public in, input uh, section here in a little bit, we want to know your thoughts on what you think about these goals. Are these focused on the right thing? Uh, the 2016 plan also had a number of mitigation objectives, and there's not a one-for-one -one linkage between with the goals here. These are just five objectives that are a little more closely focused. So uh, the county already has a very active public awareness and information program for hazard mitigation, and they want to develop and expand on that. Uh, enhance training both for hazard prevention and what you can do to mitigate against hazards. Uh, they want to uh, do more to incorporate uh, the principles of risk reduction and kind of uh, reducing disaster losses into other policy documents, initiatives, and other institutional plans. Uh, we want to continue to collaborate with our area partners through things like mutual aid agreements and other long-term regional planning efforts. Uh, and then lastly is reduce the vulnerability of local assets to the impacts of hazards. And that doesn't necessarily just mean government owned assets, but uh, assets at the local level that are going to be impacted by the hazards. Uh, again, the county or the, uh, sorry, the planning team is in the process of reviewing these to see if they need to update them for 2020, but we want to get your thoughts. So uh, when you get, uh, if you have thoughts or opinions on these objectives, if you think there's something we're missing here, please tell us. Uh, when we get into mitigation actions, the 2016 plan had uh, a couple of hundred mitigation actions list identified and listed, way more than I can fit on one slide. <laughs> so I'm just going to highlight a few that have been completed since the last plan, give you a sense of what uh, the county and the participating jurisdictions are already doing. Uh, and that includes some uh, flood control improvements that were done in uh, the Boxlander or Boxelder uh, Basin area. Uh, some improvements to trail and, and stream system in the Fish Creek Corridor. Uh, the Loveland Water Treatment Plant uh, used to use chlorine as part of its water treatment class, uh, as part of its water treatment process, excuse me, uh, and they've switched to a safer product so that if there were a release of that chemical, it wouldn't be nearly as hazardous or damaging. Uh, City of Estes Park has purchased a jet cleaner that they can use to clean debris out of culverts and ditches so that they're less likely to back up and clog and flood. 
Uh, the Upper Thompson Sanitation District has uh, done a number of things to improve their uh, communications uh, systems, both internally and externally. Uh, Pinewood Springs Fire Protection District has bought a new generator for their fire station so that they can uh, uh, do a better job of maintaining operations during a power outage. And a number of jurisdictions have also updated uh, response plans or continuity plans. Uh, this is by no means a comprehensive list. As I said, the whole list would be in like five point font and no one would be able to read it. Uh, but just some highlights of some ty the types of projects that uh, county and participating jurisdictions have been engaged in. As you, you probably get a sense from that, that there's the types of mitigation actions you can look at. There's a very uh, broad category of types of things that you can do to reduce uh, to reduce losses. But they generally, we generally tend to kind of group them into four broad categories. The first is plans and regulations, which are things like land use ordinances. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, like, you know, can you build in the floodplain or what can you build in the floodplain or how can you build in the floodplain? Uh, building codes, adopting modern building codes and enforcing their use in uh, new structures is a huge uh, um, mitigation activity. A tremendous thing you can do to reduce future losses. There's also uh, structure and infrastructure projects. These are more kind of traditional uh, building projects that are going to reduce uh, reduce damage. It can be anything like uh, buying out a property in the floodplain uh, and, or elevating a structure that's in the floodplain so that when the area floods, the property doesn't isn't damaged. Uh, it can also be something like uh, running utilities, putting power lines underground or strengthening poles so that they're less likely to blow over in high wind. We can also see education and awareness uh, activities such as uh, radio or television or television kind of PSAs or public service announcements uh, and outreach activities to educate people about hazards and what they can do to protect themselves against them, uh, as well as uh, websites and other stuff. Again, these are all stuff that the county is already doing. So none of this is, uh, is new. Uh, and then lastly, a lot of systems you, or a lot of activities you can look at to kind of strengthen natural systems uh, so uh, to reduce impacts and help them kind of be more resilient and that can include uh, things like reinforcing slopes for uh, against erosion control or stream banks for um, to uh, uh, capture sediment uh, or restoring stream corridors so that to their uh, uh, to more uh, make them more resilient and, and uh, uh, resistant to disasters. I'm going to talk specifically about a couple of different uh, types of projects so that are that are um, when, that uh, are potentially eligible for FEMA funding. Uh, specifically for flood, there's uh, can be anything from uh, infrastructure projects, like uh, I said, putting in a bigger culvert in an area that uh, is too small for the flooding that happens there, or reinforcing a bridge so that it is uh, less likely or uh, more able to withstand flooding. Uh, can include uh, flood reduction projects, can include things like adding detention ponds to help catch uh, heavy rain and runoff so that it doesn't flood uh, built areas, or channel stabilization to keep the, the flooding in the bank and make it less of a, uh, keep the water where it's supposed to be. Uh, there are projects we can do to flood proof homes so, so that they are less likely to be damaged if they do get uh, flooded, as well as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, mentioned on the last slide, uh, potentially elevating those structures so that if the area does get, get flooded, the structure isn't damaged. And then kind of in the extreme case, uh, there's some cases where uh, we may want to buy out some properties, uh, whether they're homes or businesses or whatever that's located in high risk areas, particularly if they're uh, at a high risk of flooding, it may be more cost effective to buy those properties out and turn that into parks or green space or some other property that is uh, to be less impacted by flooding. Similarly for wildfires, there's a number of different activities you can do, including uh, creating defensible space. Uh, that may be the county actually going out and creating defensible space around critical facilities or government-owned uh, assets, but also could be uh, you know, projects uh, to encourage homeowners or to give incentives to homeowners to do the same thing around, around their properties if they're in areas at risk of wildfire. Uh, projects uh, to reduce uh, wildfire fuels through uh, removing vegetation or thinning out vegetation, clearing out slash, clearing out tree branches. It's actually really, really effective for reducing the impact of wildfires 
uh, the, the downside of them, of course, is that that stuff tends to grow back. So you have to tend to uh, do these sorts of activities every few years. Uh, if you remember that slide I showed uh, early on about the different cost benefit of different uh, types of mitigation activities, you may have noticed that wildfire mitigation was only three for one uh, compared to seven to one for flooding. And that's the reason why is because you tend to have to do these uh, fuels reduction activities are not a one and done type of project. And then lastly, uh, building structures that are more resistant to wildfire, whether that's using uh, ignition resistant shingles or what have you. A few other types of, of projects for different hazards that, uh, that uh, may be possibilities. And some of these the county uh, has done or is considering, but these are just kind of general uh, types of things. I mentioned property acquisition, not just from flooding, but from in any hazard area, if there are areas that are at risk of, uh, of a landslide or whatever, that you may want to buy those properties out or change the use of those areas. Uh, for landslide, uh, there are projects you can do to help stabilize the slope or channel to reduce the impacts of that landslide. Uh, protecting utilities, again, could be something like burying power lines or strengthening power lines to make them more uh, uh, more resilient to high winds and disasters. Uh, you may want to look at creating safe rooms, not, which are good not just for tornadoes, but also, but really for any severe weather, uh, so that people have the ability to take shelter during a severe weather incident. Uh, I mentioned, alluded to earlier, uh, installing generators at critical facilities or having the ability to bring in a portable generator if you need to, so that you have uh, backup power for that facility. And then there's a number of uh, climate resilience activities look at uh, things like uh, recharging aquifers, uh, under, um, groundwater aquifers, and, and so forth. Uh, so there's a wide variety, and th this is in no uh, sense meant to be all-inclusive, but just kind of give you a sense of the type of projects that uh, the, the county is considering. Or looking at. Uh, and I'm not going to go through this slide in detail either, but uh, this gives you a sense of the types of, of factors or characteristics we look at once we, as we identify projects of how do we prioritize which are the ones we want to focus on, or which are the ones that the county wants to uh, uh, put their money in. We look at different characteristics like what are the social impacts uh, of this project, what are the economic benefits of doing it, what are the environmental impacts, uh, does it protect vulnerable populations. Um, does it address one of the high risk hazards? Obviously, those high risk hazards we want to focus on more than those medium or lower risk hazards. Uh, if there's a project that addresses multiple hazards or multiple objectives, uh, so much the better. And again, protecting those critical facilities or critical infrastructure is also uh, definitely a priority. All right, so that's kind of an overview of the mitigation strategy. And I've kind of talked about what the hazards are and what the county's doing about them. Uh, here's the kind of schedule we're looking at to continue or to move forward with this process in the coming months. And of course, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, the situation uh, had, is, uh, is fluid and may be changing uh, even by the time I'm done recording this. Uh, but this is the schedule we're on right now. And all of this, of course, is subject to change. Uh, we've tried to space this out enough. We want to get it done in a timely fashion, uh, but we also want to leave room that we're not pulling people away from uh, more pressing uh, act, uh, duties and activities right now. So, uh, but we've, as I mentioned, we had the, the project kickoff uh, meeting last month and the risk assessment meeting a couple weeks ago, having our first public meeting tonight. Uh, the next steps then is in uh, either June or July, we'll have our third uh, planning team meeting, which will be focused on uh, the mitigation strategy side, uh, finalizing goals and objectives and uh, updating actions and activities. Uh, a final plan review meeting in, in uh, the end of the summer and then either uh, we'll have, then have that first draft for internal review in August or September and then shooting for September to October time frame to have uh, a, a draft of the plan available for public review and comment as well as uh, we'll have that second public meeting. Uh, and that meeting may be in person or it may be another webinar, another virtual meeting depending on what the conditions are like by that time. So uh, once that's been done and we've made any uh, another revision to the draft based on public input, uh, then we'll submit that plan to the state. And once the Colorado Office of Emergency Management blesses off on it, they'll send it to, uh, to FEMA for review. 
Uh, once FEMA approves it, hopefully by the end of the year, we'll get that approval back. Uh, and then the county and the participating jurisdic jurisdictions can all uh, formally adopt the plan, and that's when it becomes finalized. Uh, again, we very much want your input, and now we're about to get into the part where uh, instead of me talking, it's you talking to us and, and telling us what, uh, wh where we're right and where we're wrong and what else you think we need to be considering or any questions you might have. So uh, we're going to open it up here for questions and comment here in a second. So feel free to either, uh, if you can raise your hand, if you want to ask a comment verbally, or you can type that question uh, or comment into the chat box and we can address it that way. I mentioned before the public survey we have, you can take that now or bookmark it and take it later. And then down the road again, like I said, uh, late summer or early fall, we'll have that uh, public review draft and uh, second public meeting uh, scheduled to be, to be announced. So the, the questions we have for you as we open up for comment, we want to know what hazards are you concerned about impacting your community? When I say your community, we're assuming that you're within Larimer County, uh, but whether that's, you know, whether that's Estes Park or Fort Collins or the unincorporated county, whatever you consider your community, what are the hazards that concern you? What are the hazards that have impacted your community and what have been the impacts of those hazards in the past? And then based on everything you've learned here tonight, what actions do you think the county should be looking at to address those hazards and reduce the impacts of those hazards? And then kind of the catch-all question, what else should we be considering? What are we missing? Uh, what else do, should be included or incorporated in this plan? All right, and with that, I'm going to give my voice a rest and uh, open it up to your questions and comments. And again, thank you very much for, uh, for listening. Michelle, you're muted. <laughs> thank you, Shell. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was just going on. Um, Scott, thank you for putting that together. That was very informative. I do have to give you a hard time, though. The Broncos won the Super Bowl in 2016. It wasn't... <laughs> okay, not the last. That's true. <laughs> um, so, um, I, I, you know, you threw me off there, but you recovered nicely. Um, we have a couple questions, um, and they're more they're more housekeeping questions. So let's get kind of these housekeeping questions um, over with, and then Scott and Shale, I want to um, you get you might need to repeat that input those input questions, Scott, that you said at the end there. Um, sure. Again, for everyone, for all of our attendees today, um, you can put a question in the Q and A box um, at the bottom of your screen, or you can raise your hand. Um, and, um, and ask it live. I don't think we have anybody on the phone, but just in case we have someone on the phone, um, to raise your hand, you need to hit star nine. Um, so first question, and this one, this one we can do for everybody. The question is, um, can we get an email copy of the PowerPoint material to send out? Um, yes, and I'm sure we have all the emails. I guess I shouldn't, I assume, Scott, you can share it, but is that okay to do? Yes, that's going to be posted. Uh, it'll all be up on the county's uh, uh, website. Perfect. And um, when you registered, we got your email addresses, so we can send it out that way, too. Definitely. Second question, and this, again, seems to be more of a housekeeping question, and what I will try to do, if you guys are talking about other things, I'm going to go try to find the link for the survey. Um, and I will type in an answer to this question with the link to the survey. Really, the question is, are spaces in the public survey, are those the link? Were they underscores or were they spaces? And I'm pretty sure they're underscores. Okay. All right. I'm going to go find that um, for everybody. But... Let me see what... Also, have. if people go to the larimer.org slash emergency, um, our hazard mitigation column has the public facing hazard mitigation website. Um, underneath that column, it just says um, hazard mitigation plan update, I think. And so all the information that people need as far as like um, agendas and this meeting will be there as well as the public survey link are all there if people want to follow along in the whole process. So it's another way to find it too. 
I'll put that link in here as well so people can get directly to it. Um, so as you guys are, I have another question. Oh, I, someone was just saying those underscores were hidden on the, maybe Scott, if you ever do that presentation again, it looked like the underscores were hidden. Yeah, it's a good point. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, thanks. Right. But I don't see anyone raising their hand and I'm not getting any other questions while I try to find the link. So I don't know if you want to um, re-ask those questions you had at the end, Scott, and see if anybody is willing to give a little more input. Sure. Uh, the first question, uh, it was just, what hazards are you concerned about impacting your community or what hazards have you experienced uh, impacting your community that either agrees with or more importantly, if something disagrees with uh, our analysis or what I what uh, the slides that we showed what what are your experiences with hazards and what are you concerned about? And don't feel like it has to be in question form. If you guys just have answers to that, you want to type in um, to the Q&A. Um, we'll keep those as as documentation of how you would like to answer the questions. So absolutely. Uh, the second question was, and we could put these back up again, the uh, mitigation goals. Uh, if anyone had has any comment on uh, on those or thinks there are any any changes or edits that need to be make made to those or, or that, that uh, anything that they're missing that you think is important enough to address, we, uh, we'd love to hear your, your feedback on that. Uh, and then the last one is uh, what mitigation actions, and again, this is just in kind of the broad sense, what do you think that Larimer County uh, to include the you know the the cities and towns and special districts, what do you think uh, we should be doing to uh, address those hazards and to limit uh, limit losses and protect uh, the people and property from disasters? So I'm that person who will sit here awkwardly until one of you um, gives us an answer or raises your hand. That's why they hire me to do these things. And I guess it's not as bad, you know, from uh, a distance as it is when you're sitting in a room together and I'm making people answer questions, but it looks like we have one, so that's great. So, um, one of our participants says their family has been affected directly by both the Bobcat Gulch fire um, and the September 2013 flooding. Um, and they have questions about the low hazard dam in Cedar Park slash Cedar Springs, Colorado area. What's, uh, I guess, what specific, are there specific questions that you have about that or you just want to, to know about? Just want to know what that dam is about. Uh, feel free to answer. raise your hand and I can let you talk if you want to do it that way too. And while we're doing that, I'm going to pull up some information on that dam. Maybe she doesn't want to talk and that's okay. You don't have to. And while Scott's looking up information. I can, uh, since we have your email address, I can uh, reach out to you with any, uh, I or Shale can reach out and, and uh, see what specific questions you have. Uh, the, the low hazard dams, uh, if, it, if it was uh, shown on there as, as being a low hazard dam, what that means is that based on the Corps of Engineers assessment, um, there's no one, um, there aren't, there are no people or property that live in, in uh, right downstream of the dam or in an area that would be flooded or inundated if that dam uh, fails. Dam inspections. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Um, Shale, I don't know if you can address dam inspections or if uh, maybe we just put, uh, put her in touch with uh, the Dam Safety Bureau folks. We do, we do have representatives from the State Dam Safety Bureau that are part of the planning team, uh, but they're not on this call uh, this evening. Um, yeah, I'm trying to pull up the question. Um, so it's just looking to get in touch with folks that are um, with the dam inspection, or do you have a specific question regarding how dam inspections are done, or <laughs> I guess the clarifier?
And maybe you guys can reach out to her via email. She says, yeah, a box, I'd be happy to do that. Um, which I would like you all to know that are here tonight. If your dogs would like to join us, I'm sure we <laughs> absolutely. I'm willing to see some dogs. So <laughs> it looks like um, Roseanne's going to do a little more checking on, on about questions, and and we'll reach out to you, Roseanne. But thanks for being involved. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing anyone else raising their hand or asking questions. So at this point, um, while people maybe think about it, I'd turn it back over to our panelists and say, is there anything else you guys want to add tonight? Um, do you want to reiterate next steps? That sort of thing. Well, I think everyone's probably tired of my voice. So, uh, Shale, uh, do, do you have anything you want to to highlight or from the county's perspective? Um, I guess I would just really stress that public survey piece. Um, like Scott mentioned in the presentation, we don't want this to just be something that the county puts together um, along with our stakeholders, and then it just kind of sits on a shelf. We really want this to be an inclusive community process as much as possible. Um, and we really want to make it something that's valuable to the community and that actually addresses the community's concerns. So if I could stress anything tonight, it's that you provide feedback of some kind, whether it's through um, the Q&A here tonight, or if you want to um, email one of us and provide feedback, reach out to somebody um, from your community that's helping with this process as far as a stakeholder or a participating agency, um, or that survey I think would be excellent. So kind of the part I wanted to stress, but. <laughs> <laughs> the other piece, uh, just to reiterate, is in a few months, we are going to have a draft plan for review and comment, um, and it's going to be thick. I'm not going to lie. These are, these are not short documents. It's not a, not, not a quick summer read, uh, but we would love to have, uh, you know, that's when you actually can get into more of the meat of uh, the different hazards or the areas that are interest to you or your specific town or city or communities. Uh, so, uh, now that we have your email addresses, those of you who've joined, we will, uh, um, I'm not going to spam you, but we'll uh, let you know when that uh, uh, plan is available for review. And that's another opportunity to get uh, more specific, uh, more, more, uh, more specific answers for you or more specific questions from you. And I would uh, add to the, this that the, the survey is going to be an important um, way to provide input and Oftentimes from the public, we get input on potential mitigation projects or problem areas that we could address specifically through an action in this plan. So uh, please give us your, your input on that um, or air potential problem areas or the things that keep you up at night. Um, we know that the county has been through some disasters in the past and some of you have lived that. Um, so again, we, we'd like to find ways this plan and planning effort can make 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 those impacts uh, uh, lessened in the future. So appreciate everybody's in, uh, interest and involvement. Also, I would just like to say thank you so much for participating with us virtually in a <laughs> socially distanced environment. This isn't the most ideal way to do these kind of public meetings. And we just really appreciate the folks that took the time to join us tonight, um, sit through the webinar, um, see what we have to say and participate. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I was going to reiterate, reiterate what Shale's saying. Um, thank you guys for being here tonight. Um, we're glad we actually had so many participate. Um, so thank you for coming tonight and being involved. Um, just a couple housekeeping things, a reminder that we will post this on the Larimer County YouTube channel. Um, and we do have all of your email addresses and your Scott's right, we won't spam you, but things I have notes that um, we'll reach out to you with is a copy of the presentation. Um, we'll include a link to the video um, and there will be contact information for either Shale or Scott or both um, for you guys to um, ask your questions with. And the final thing we'll include in that is just a link to the survey. And we did put that in the answered Q&A questions, but just another way that you guys can access that. Um, we'll make sure we include that in the email as well. So 
with that being said, um, we have some people thanking us. So thank you, um, Elaine, for being here. Um, we will sign off for the night. Everybody take care and stay healthy and enjoy the wonderful weather. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.